so um, as you know, the, this session is part of a comprehensive uh, program that consists of uh, several webinars that target uh, patients, community, and people, so family and patients living with aplastic anemia and PNH. The name is the topic on focus on aplastic anemia and PNH uh, for patient and family. It has been organized, of course, by Diara Neurobrunet, but the, with the fabulous support of the Patients Association, so the PNH support. Uh, focus on PNH represented by Maria Piggin and also Lichter Zellen, focus on aplastic anemia and PNH and represented by Pascal Olivia Burmester and also um, Eurordis and of course PNH Global Alliance. Today we are going to talk about pregnancy for aplastic anemia and PNH. As always, as you know, um, we have a duo of an expert uh, clinicians and a patient advocate um, presenting the, the topic. So today we have, as a patient representative today, Alex Nylor. She's a British PNH patient that was diagn diagnosed in uh, 2017. And uh, when she was mid thirties, uh, shortly after she began treatment on soluries and she became pregnant and now has a five year old son. Uh, so she, 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 she will talk about uh, this experience of uh, pregnancy. And then with us, uh, we have Dr. Oshman um, that is, of course, actively uh, involved uh, in the European Society for Bone Marrow Transplantation, um, and she's an expert of uh, this topic also. So, shall I uh, jump in and just talk a little bit about my personal experiences um, and um, some of the things that I think we will want to cover um, just whilst all of this is going on. Um, so yes, hello, my name is Alex Naylor and um, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Maria Angela. Uh, and uh, yes, um, my memory is a little hazy from going through pregnancy five years ago. And uh, I found out I was pregnant very shortly after starting Celeris uh, or Eclutumab. And um, throughout my pregnancy, uh, it was pretty clear that I, it was a high risk pregnancy, but that I had a very joined up team who uh, liaised with the obstetricians and the midwives quite regularly. Um, I think Britta is about to join us. Um, and uh, one of the main things that I think is really important if you're considering being pregnant is making sure that you are uh, completely open with your hematologists and your specialists, your PNH specialists and AA uh, specialists, but also that you build a really good support network around you of the specialists and that you know exactly who is the person who is accountable, who you speak to first and foremost, if and when there are any problems during your pregnancy. So, hello, Britta. Hi. So, hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I was just giving a little opening about myself and my experiences and uh, mentioned how important it is, I don't know if you heard, that you have an open relationship with your specialists and your hematologists uh, and that you have a good support network around you uh, before you even become pregnant. Uh, and that's where we got to. So, should I hand over to you, Britta? So, um, like you heard, we are talking today about pregnancies, and could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so, these are my disclosures, and the next one, please. Yeah, I think um, the main questions are if uh, pregnancies are uh, possible, and uh, what are the risks, and what are the recommendations. The next one, please. So, um, I think uh, we have in a plastic and PNH a, a special situation 
uh, because uh, it's a chronic illness and uh, even more it's a rare um, disorder. And so I think we have uh, to take in account the quality of life and the prognosis um, and uh, the special um, points like uh, the reproductive requirements and the treatment option. And uh, uh, if you look um, uh, on the sum, you will uh, see the relevance of the family planning. The next one, please. Um, as we have now um, much better um, treatment options for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, um, uh, this uh, topic of family planning is um, increased in, in relevance. Um, so um, I think all PNH patients uh, know that uh, in former times, the mortality of uh, PNH patients was uh, really high. Um, and uh, we could now reduce this with complement inhibition so uh, that the life ex expectancy is nearly the same like in um, healthy people. Uh, I think the family planning issue is uh, um, important as um, uh, a lot of patients uh, are in, um, in the age about 30 to 45 at diagnosis. So it's the age where we uh, usually uh, look for family and pregnancies and so on. So the next one, please. Um, so um, I just <laughs> told uh, this earlier this, uh, this afternoon, we, we talked and laughed about that, but uh, I think uh, to break to get pregnant, we need two persons. And so uh, also the issues of the male PNH patients are, are of relevance. Uh, so um, uh, due to the fatigue and anemia, I think there's an impaired uh, libido and um, interest on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we all uh, know that uh, due to complement activation and uh, intravascular hemolysis, there's also um, the, um, the case of an erectile dysfunction um, in PNH patients, not so uh, rare. So the next one, please. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have the same situation in the female patients. I think fatigue, anemia um, ha is not dependent on sex. And uh, we have additional and um, impaired nidation. So um, the problem is to get um, pregnant due to uh, circulatory disorders and microthrombi. The, the next one, please. So um, the risk during pregnancy um, uh, are mainly due to complement activation. So uh, we have an increased hemolytic activity and the associated risk uh, of that during the uh, pregnancy. So. Uh, we have a change in the blood counts. Uh, normally we could have hemolytic crisis due to the complement activation and drop embolism in mother and child. Um, and uh, you could have a fetal damage uh, due to the thromboembolic events or anemia or circulatory disturbances. And uh, there are often premature births with a low birth weight. The next one, please. Uh, these are data um, uh, several years ago before we had the option of complement inhibition during pregnancy in PNH. Uh, and you see here the analysis of 27 pregnancies um, uh, of PNH patients. And you see that we have here a really high rate of complications. Um, uh, in mothers as well as in the child. So we had 95% uh, uh, of uh, PNH patients during pregnancy with, um, uh, with complications, um, mostly not very, um, not very difficult, like um, cytopenias, anemia with a need for transfusion, but also 16% uh, 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 of thrombosis and 8% mortality rate. And uh, I think um, you see that really quite a number. 
Um, the same uh, is uh, in the in the child, where we have a uh, mortality rate of uh, four percent, um, and um, a relevant number of impaired fetal development. So I think you see, um, based on these numbers, um, the cause why we. Um, 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 explained our per, per patients in earlier times uh, that we can't recommend a pregnancy and that they should avoid this um, um, because of the potential risk. The next one, please. Um, so um, after um, the availability of complement inhibition, uh, the situation changed. Um, we uh, had the first pregnancies during um, the um, uh, trials um, of uh, ecolizumab, I think because of the reduced anemia and fatigue and um, the increasing activity. Uh, and um, uh, after the positive experiences, we um, um, treated more patients with uh, ecolizumab uh, during the pregnancy. And you see here an analysis of 75 pregnancies in 61 PNH patients. And you see uh, here the mortality uh, of the mothers were um, 0%. Um, there were um, just 3% uh, thromboembolic events, um, and um, we have no um, high, uh, not a high complication rate, um, also in the uh, in the children. So the next one, please. So I think I um, will not go in detail because of the time. Um, it's just important to, uh, to know that uh, there are no development disturbances in children of PNH patients uh, with ecolizumab treatment during the pregnancy. So uh, you have to have a fear regarding uh, this during um, the pregnancy. So the next one, please. Um, uh, the main point um, is um, that um, we have um, in bleedings in 10 uh, patients during this analysis. Um, I have to mention that we um, recommend uh, um, a heparin uh, prophylaxis uh, during pregnancy uh, in PNH. Um, and we have two um, thromboembolic uh, events. Um, but not during the pregnancy, uh, but uh, after um, the, the birth. So um, we couldn't uh, say at the moment if uh, the uh, heparin uh, is of benefit for the patient in this situation. Uh, the next one. Um, uh, we had an, an analysis of uh, the umbilical cord blood and uh, the uh, uh, breast milk. And um, uh, just to sum it up, there are no concerns about uh, breastfeeding. Um, and um, there were in a part of the patients uh, ecolizumab in the cord blood. Um, but um, there were no abnormalities in the examined uh, newborn in the complement system. So the next one. Just uh, to, to say uh, uh, between the, the slides, so I will go um, uh, fast uh, through this because we, uh, we had these uh, problems in the beginning, but uh, please uh, just uh, take this as an invitation for, uh, for questions afterwards. So um, important point is that we have the option to, uh, to ecolizumab treatment to control the uh, hemolytic activity during uh, the pregnancy. And um, therefore we have um, a better outcome. Up to now, we see no um, uh, uh, effects on um, the, uh, the uh, children um, so that we have uh, no problem with the recommendation. The next one, please. Um, so uh, at the moment, uh, we recommend um, the patients to monitor um, in regular distance for hemolysis 
uh, we can adjust the ecolizumab dose on demand. Therefore, it's important to know if uh, the hemolysis is increasing. We also recommend the heparin prophylaxis and uh, folic acid um, in high doses and vitamin B12 as uh, needed. Transfusion should be given um, on demand. So we um, recommend um, uh, erythrocyte concentrate transfusion, transfusion um, in cases with a, a hemoglobin below 8.0. Uh, the next one, please. Um, the uh, uh, further recommendations are to do um, regular ultrasound control of the um, perfusion and the fetal development. Um, it's, um, uh, if it's possible, a 3D uh, ultrasound is a good uh, thing because you can really see the, the details then. Um, I think that is important important because you can see then very early if uh, there is a, a disturbance of the development. Um, so um, the most important point is that um, it's important to have an expert and a network um, uh, which is it's working to solve possible uh, problems and complications. Um, because uh, if you have uh, this network, it's uh, usually well manageable um, and um, the pregnancy uh, should uh, not be combined with uh, relevant risk, but it's a high risk pregnancy. So you have to look for the specialists and the center. The next one. Um, we have a um, similar uh, situation in a plastic anemia uh, with an improved prognosis. And um, uh, so especially in young patients in a childbearing age, um, the family planning is also from um, uh, relevance. The next one, please. So also there we have the problems uh, regarding fatigue and anemia and impotence and additionally the uh, problems um, of uh, reduced sperm count and motility after stem cell transplantation and a negative effect uh, on the sperms due to cyclosporine treatment. These are the problems of the male and the next one please. Um, we have uh, this um, toxicity of cyclosporine, especially due to the uh, sperms. Uh, I noticed this earlier, so I think we uh, happen to go in detail here. The next one, please. Um, so uh, in, uh, in the women, uh, we have to say that we have no um, hints that the use of cyclosporine um, is of an increase of risk for, uh, for the pregnancy regarding to uh, malformation or miscarriage or um, uh, neonatal complications or development impairment. So um, we have um, the clue that there might be um, higher rates um, of uh, preterm delivery um, in the first three months. Um, but it's uh, unclear if this uh, is due to the aplastic anemia or because we are looking closer than in uh, regular uh, pregnancies. So the next one, please. Uh, in uh, ATG, uh, we have, regarding to ATG in pregnancy, we have uh, less uh, data, but up to now, uh, now there are no um, reports of um, fetal adverse effects due to ATG, and um, therefore ATG therapy is indicated uh, and should not be um, 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 delayed um, to avoid um, uh, difficult and um, risky cytopenia complications. So um, um, uh, this immune suppressive treatments uh, can um, execute it in the breast milk. So 
um, here uh, breastfeeding is not recommended for the patients. The next one, please. Uh, so uh, stem cell transplantation is, I think, a um, topic of um, upcoming uh, event in the end of the month or the next month. Um, I think you will be informed about that. The next one, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, the risk in aplastic anemias are, uh, for my, uh, from my point of view, um, higher than in PNH. Um, we have the situation that aplastic anemia usually worsens during the pregnancy. Um, uh, there are series um, of patients uh, who showed that um, especially a significant decrease of the platelet count uh, has a special risk. And we have the problem that uh, bleedings and sepsis um, are um, uh, uh, a reason for death in pregnant women with a plastic anemia. Um, and um, the cause is not um, sure up to now, but um, it's postulated that there might be a hormonal influence. Um, next one, please. Uh, so, we uh, um, recommend the following procedure for plastic anemia. Um, so um, the patient should think twice uh, about the decision to get, uh, to get pregnant because of the serious risk. Um, it's, um, not, um, um, uh, it's not helpful to wait. Uh, with treatment um, uh, until, um, until delivery um, because uh, the highest risk are uh, due to the uh, pancytopenia and not due to the uh, treatment. Um, so um, we uh, recommend um, to um, uh, start a treatment with immunosuppression. The next one. Um, so um, uh, one point, um, you should um, uh, look if there's an option for uh, cryoconservation in every case. So I think this uh, might be a point um, uh, just to mention. So um, um, again, uh, we recommend to start an immunosuppression um, if um, it's indicated. Um, the uh, supportive management with transfusions uh, should be done um, up uh, in hemoglobin uh, value below um, eight uh, gram per uh, deciliter and a platelet count below 20 giga per liter. If possible, um, cyclosporin uh, could be avoided in the early pregnancy due to this uh, um, possibility of a higher uh, miscarriage um, due to cyclosporine in that time. And again, um, like in uh, PNH, the most important point is that the pregnancy is uh, supervised by an, a specialist in uh, combination with the other disciplines involved. The next one, please. The next one, please. Hmm. I'm sorry, they are not changing. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, I wasn't nice. sure if I, I will stop sharing your return. I'm still away, so but I'm still there with you. That's <laughs> good information. No, no, it was me. I mean, it was me. It was <laughs> the Zoom today. It's really not helping. So I'm really happy that the 20... Um, Participants still are um, as patient there. to uh, staying with us. So it's not working. Um, Maria Pascal, can you maybe try your to share? I will try last time. I can try. Okay. No, it's not working. So I, 
I will just, should I just talk a little bit <laughs> on? So, because I have hey, now could my- Could you just let me know which slide it was so I can share the- The 25th. 26th. Okay. Yes, the now the 26th, yes. But otherwise I can just talk without the slides. There's still two additional ones without pictures. So um, I will just summarize um, the, the problem, problems uh, of family planning in- Sorry. <laughs> Yes. No problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I will try it on the old way, old fashioned. Can you see it? Um, Yes, yes, I cannot, yes. I can just I can just sleep a slide on my laptop because I'm I'm uh, here with let, the let, iPad and yeah, I yeah, have yeah. so um, let me just share the the um so but it's just a summary of the of the block problems we have to solve. Um the first one is that we have uh, difficulties in, in getting pregnant. Ah, okay, here we are. <laughs> so, um, due to the mentioned fatigue or anemia, um, these problems with dation or sperm function. And on the other hand, we have the risk for mother and child during the pregnancy. We have the, the risk, especially in the PNH, um, due to hemolytic crisis and thromboembolic events. And uh, we have risk, especially in aplastic anemia due to bleedings and infections. We have in, in both um, um, the risk for um, delayed fetal growth or abortions, uh, or low um, uh, birth weight. This is caused by an insufficient um, um, circulatory or low hemoglobin and uh, low um, ox oxygen in, uh, in, in the placenta. Um, the next one, please. So um, the take home message um, should be that um, we have um, due to a better prognosis of a black stick anemia and PNH, um, uh, uh, higher importance of the topic uh, of family planning. Um, there are um, improved uh, therapeutic measures um, who have uh, increased uh, the, the ch chance to um, make a pregnancy possible. Um, and um, compared with the past, the risk due to the pregnancy uh, has decreased. So, but the most important point I, I just um, can say it again is um, that this is only the case if you are uh, supervised by an aplastic anemia or PNH specialist during the pregnancy and in combination with uh, the other colleagues involved. So I think that is really the most important take home message um, you have um, to uh, be in contact during the pregnancy with a specialist um, to um, have um, a safe pregnancy and delivery. So um, now I, open for questions and discussions and um, yeah. Thank you, Britta, that was really useful. Um, and I have a few questions that um, I think that we could touch on. Um, one of them is that um, we all know that uh, AA, having AA and having PNH can be quite lonely and isolating. And also pregnancy can be one of those very isolating periods of a life. So, um, and you've talked there about um, the hematologist specialists being the most important uh, people in the dis in the multidisciplinary group. And I just wondered what sort of other advice you have for patients about how they can build that network, um, maybe about how organized they might need to be or how um, you mentioned about being in contact with a specialist center. Um, what mm -hmm. sort of the what are the sort of like grassroots things that patients can do? Mm -hmm. So I think um, 
one point which is uh, not very um, medical sophisticated is um, that it um, would make sense to get in touch with uh, patient groups. Um, I think you have the option to find their patients with similar experiences. And I think that would in, in every case uh, have to feel not as lonely. So um, I think that uh, might be might be helpful to side of the to side of the physicians. Um, uh, uh, on the other hand, um, I think um, the uh, building this network um, is uh, possible if you just uh, talk talk openly with with the physicians. So um, uh, it's important um, to um, to tell them that they should just communicate uh, with the PMA specialist. So I think you have um, this PNA or plastic anemia specialist in the center of the network. And um, uh, then you have to, uh, to look for the contact between uh, the several disciplines. And um, I think that is really the, the most important point. And um, uh, it, it, you have always the question if, if there is an option to see which one is the best one for this situation. Um, I think um, um, important is that the physician uh, you choose is um, um, uh, will, con will get in contact with the hematologist. I think that is important that he uh, he has no problem uh, to communicate and uh, to to be in contact and uh, also to to ask questions. So um, sometimes uh, this is not so easy uh, to learn. That um, uh, perhaps um, it's better to go to another person uh, with with questions. So um, I think that uh, that is uh, um, is the point you can do. You can say, okay, um, please, um, if there's a problem, get in contact with uh, this hematologist who is uh, who is um, responsible for the teenage. And um, I think it's it's um, it's a good thing just to to um, to tell the uh, physicians that. Uh, you know, and you do not expect that they are familiar with TNH or plastic anemia because these are very rare disorders, and so they have not to be uh, ashamed <laughs> that they are not used to um, care for patients with TNH. And in this context, um, uh, I think you, you should try to uh, introduce your hematologist. Thank you. Um, we have a hand up from Annalisa. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, Bye. thank you. Thank you very much for this um, speech. It was very, very useful, especially for me, because uh, actually <clears throat> I was pregnant four years ago, and uh, now I'm a patient. I didn't know to have the PNH. Uh, I'm uh, from Italy and I'm representing the Association of Italian uh, Patients of uh, PNH here. Uh, actually, I was exactly in the cluster that you represented very well regarding the new world that was, uh, in a way, before the term and uh, I had issues. And uh, she was uh, his girl, she was born below three kilos. So, actually, exactly as you said in your slide. Unfortunately, I didn't know to have the PNH. Unfortunately, this is a disease very rare, as you said. Uh, being in contact with the hematologist is important when you know to have it. My question is, I was lucky because uh, even though I didn't know to have it, my pregnancy was uh, since the beginning to the end uh, pretty good. I had a severe disease issues after, and it took one year in order to understand uh, which kind of uh, issues I had. The point is, which are the 
in your opinion, in your experiences, uh, considering uh, maybe more more patients that you saw, which is the uh, next time that uh, maybe the gynecologist can look at uh, to have a sort of doubt regarding this kind of, of disease? Because uh, I think that uh, maybe very few, but uh, some women like me discover the, the PNH afterwards. Uh, I don't know. My my question maybe are two. How many women uh, at the pregnancy uh, without knowing to have it? Uh, and uh, uh, if I am one of the few cases, so which are in your opinion the, the the stuff that you can also do, maybe inside our association to to acknowledge some uh, some uh, some exams, for example. I'm very sorry, but um, I had really problems to understand you because there was was a little bit surrounding. So I don't know, um, Alex. Um, she was, Annalisa was asking um, um, sort of what can be done or how, how, what is the pathway for women who find out that they have aplastic anemia or PNH? during their pregnancy, as was the case in her scenario. Mm -hmm. Exactly, um, thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, it's not uh, so, um, so certain that um, especially a plastic anemia is diagnosed uh, during, um, during a pregnancy. And um, I think um, in that context, we have just um, to go on with uh, with the with the treatment of the aplastic anemia and um, uh, have to look closely for uh, for the lab values and um, but in that case I think if you have an an um, uh, an, an diagnosis um, uh, of the aplastic anemia uh, so the colleagues will be very close. Um, regarding your lab uh, values, so um, I, I can't hear if it was a severe or very severe um, aplastic anemia and um, uh, what was the treatment of that, so um, I, I'm sorry there were some connection problems. So. Yes, so I actually see you, sorry, I'm going back to uh brown work so um, the connection mm -hmm. is uh, I'm sorry I'm on the bicycle now unfortunately I didn't have any kind of treatment because uh, they discovered me the PNH after the pregnancy so that was my issue so um, um, okay. I'm just representing a very very rare case in which uh, at the end it was afterwards mm -hmm. So my my question was, uh, I mean, uh, um, I did a lot of exam blood analysis uh, every month before, and nobody was able to to understand it. Uh, I'm asking you in your experience if there is a special exam that maybe can foresee uh, this kind of uh, situation. So. Um... We, ha we have um, uh, the situation that um, we have um, um, a part of the patients, a percentage of the patients who have the diagnosis of aplastic anemia or PNH during, uh, during the pregnancy. And I think there are two points. Um, on the one hand, um, it's uh, just um, 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 getting worse due to pregnancy. So you have the case uh, in PNA due to the increased complement inhibition. You, you uh, just di see clinically and diagnose PNA, which were there perhaps earlier. Um, the same in, uh, in a plastic anemia. You have on the one hand the situation that um, you have a worsening, could have a worsening of uh, cytopenia due to uh, um, during the pregnancy. There are discussions uh, regarding uh, the um, uh, hormonal uh, changes as cause for, uh, for this. 
um, or um, you have sometimes a situation that um, you just mention it without clinical symptoms because during pregnancy you start to make uh, lab values. So um, these are, I think, these are um, the the main um, the main options. Uh, 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 which lead to, to diagnosis during, during pregnancy. And um, so if you, are, if you are pregnant and then um, you uh, see that you have these disorders, um, it's, uh, it's also the same. So if you have PNH, you should start immediately with complement inhibition. It's really important to, to start uh, fast. So if you have neoplastic anemia, the aim uh, have to be to um, uh, to um, get uh, an insufficient hematopoiesis because the uh, highest risk in aplastic anemia is due to uh, bleedings and infections. And um, so, um, yeah, I think this uh, are the recommendations. I, I don't know if it's uh, with this help. Yes, absolutely. Many, many thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, welcome. And then we have, we have a couple of them. Go oh, ahead. We have a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, one of them is, if PNH patients are currently not on treatment due to low clone size <laughs> and get pregnant, <laughs> wait on to treatment or just be monitored further? And if they do then start treatment, would this then be permanent or just works pregnant or needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice question. <laughs> um, so uh, it's not uh, it's not as easy. So if you have an, if, as, if you have a teenage clone uh, with perhaps five percent uh, in aplastic anemia and you have no clinical symptoms. Um, uh, I think uh, I would not start with complement inhibition, but uh, follow you very closely. If you have a PNH loan about 20% and perhaps a little bit of, um, of clinical symptoms, um, I uh, think I would start if there's a little LDH increase uh, but it uh, it happened to be very high so um yes uh, i would also start uh, patients um uh, in patients from the main inhibition uh, because of pregnancy um uh, but uh, in uh, in special circumstances but i would be um very flexible regarding this. And uh, the second one is uh, that um, we can um, we can try to, to stop um, uh, the complement inhibition after pregnancy. Yes, that is an option. Um, in the most cases uh, I, I had with this constellation, um, the women recognized due to the complement inhibition that they had before start of the complement uh, inhibition uh, more symptoms than they thought to have. So they just uh, mentioned after start that they uh, had more fatigue before start and that they are feeling um, very well with complement inhibition. So sometimes we have uh, the situation that we just go on after pregnancy with the complement inhibition. Thank you. Daisy, was that a good answer to, for your question? Okay, I'll take that as a yes, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Kirsty asked, oh yeah, she, she said thank you, perfect. So Kirsty asks, uh, on PNH, you mentioned ecolizumab, but is there any data on other treatments, for example, ravalizumab, or is the recommendation to switch to ecolizumab? 
So <laughs> we discussed this earlier um, this afternoon. <laughs> um, and um, so I, I start um, um, with, with the drugs I um, would not do. So we have now the option of proximal complement inhibition. Um, this uh, I would not recommend that. And if you have, uh, if you are a patient with proximal complement inhibition, I would change this um, uh, to C5 inhibitor in every case because we have no, um, we have no um, idea um, regarding the effects, and we have now. Um, long experience with uh, with ecolizumab and uh, nearly 20 years so um the question regarding ecolizumab and um uh, ravulizumab um so i i would beg you to to take this not as um official recommendation um, I personally have um, good experience with uh, ravulizumab in pregnancy, and therefore I would not recommend to change it back to ecolizumab. So I ho I hope this uh, helps you um, at the moment. Yeah, may maybe we could say something like there there have been cases um, of women. Yeah. Pregnant on ravulizumab, yeah. not yeah. Been scientifically approved yet. Yes, so. I think that yeah, I think that uh, will match the situation. At the moment, I try to um, to collect this that we have the base for uh, for a potential recommendation or just to um, to have the option to um, estimate this. Uh, situation better, but um, yeah. So um, at the moment, I personally, uh, but not as an of, uh, official recommendation, do not change uh, ravulizumab to ecolizumab. But if I would have a patient on C3 inhibition, I would go back to C5 inhibition to ecolizumab. So oh, if, if, if any of you become pregnant on ravulizumab, please contact uh, Dr. Hisma. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so Alex, um, do you have any uh, more? So, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. uh, one, one point. Um, uh, the thing uh, which is not so easy, therefore it's really important um, to get in contact with people who have um, done this before, it's not just a joke. Um, is uh, that it's a little bit more difficult if you have more hemolysis um, regarding uh, to the action. So if you have ecolizumab during pregnancy and you have more hemolysis, you know, okay, we give you now additional 300 milligram or we shorten up the interval and there are just um, certain rules or experiences and this is, is a little bit um, more difficult with ravulizumab because uh, of the longer interval. So um, therefore, it's uh, important to talk to someone who has uh, done this before. Alex, do you want to go on? Um, I already had one more question, which relates to where patients can find out more about um, being pregnant with their illness. But I noticed that there's a couple of questions that relate to AA on the chat, and maybe we should answer those ones first if we have a mm -hmm. quick piece of time. Yeah, okay, there's one uh, from V. Uh, good afternoon. My question is for people with AA post horse ATG. Would mm -hmm. you suggest not to embark on pregnancy at all? Are the risk too much for people with AA that want to start a family? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> The, the problem in aplastic anemia um, is, um, especially um, if you uh, had a, a treatment uh, and uh, in response now that you will have, that you could have uh, a relapse during uh, pregnancy. So um, therefore I think um, it's 
more difficult for patients with aplastic anemia to um, plan their family um, because it's uh, say kind of easier now in, in PNH regarding to complement inhibition because that's the drug which uh, acts really fast if, if there are a hemolytic crisis. But uh, in aplastic anemia, you know, because you, you had um, uh, ATG and cyclosporine uh, earlier, it means needs time and sometimes a lot of time um, before you have the response to, um, to the treatment. And um, this might be really risky uh, regarding to uh, neutropenia or, or thrombopenia. Um, therefore, um, I think it's, it's, um, it's more difficult. Um, on the other hand, uh, we know that we had, um, that we had um, a percentage of the patients who um, just uh, normalized their blood count after, after pregnancy. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think it's a, a more difficult decision. I don't know. Is this? I I, I know this. Um, I think not the answer you would like to hear, but um, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. So I think yeah. So um, I did have um, another couple of questions which kind of tie in together. So I might ask them together. But it was about again um, more on a social side for patients in that um, having a rare disease means that you can spend a lot of time having to explain yourself to people mm -hmm. and obviously with pregnancy you have a lot of appointments with people that aren't specialists um, and so do you have any tips as to what are some markers that patients should be aware of so they can be educated and say oh I think that's important I should talk to my specialist or possibly some ways that they can give an overview perhaps of their illness to say a midwife or another interested healthcare professional without taking up time of their appointment on just their illness and not actually what's going on mm. in the pregnancy. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's really an uh, important question. Um, I think um, it's um, one point um, which is important is just uh, to let your uh, contact dates of, of the uh, the contact dates of your of your specialist of your hematologist um, on every place that you give everyone um, 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 a doctor's letter and, and then the necessary information. So go active to the to the colleagues and tell them about your disorder. Yeah. Um, my experience is that the most uh, are then um, interested and, and inform uh, and, and uh, look for information. Um, I think that is, is a thing that is important. I had one a patient who, uh, who was not telling this, the, the gynecologist, uh, the local one. So I think it's important just to be open, to be open with that. And um, uh, I think the, um, uh, you get uh, information uh, on the one hand of, uh, of of your uh, from your physician um, important for you is to know um, uh, some triggers where you have to be get active um, so um, I, I think it's important that you look for the blood count for uh, clinical symptoms uh, for LDH or be very focused um, that the doctors will look for the um, uh, for the baby and the development, and that if you hear, oh, it's a little bit too small for the age, or but will come and so on. Just um, be very careful with this information because uh, it could be a sign that um, there is not enough 
uh, circulation, there is um, um, uh, a problem th that you could solve, for example, by transfusion or by complementing inhibition. So if you get um, information like that, uh, please um, be active and um, um, go uh, to your uh, go to your specialist if um, the local doctor uh, will not um, uh, just active uh, be active or um, look for this further on. So I think there are some triggers um, where you uh, should just uh, go further and and uh, and ask uh, for um, the causes. I think that's important. And for an, uh, for an overview, um, uh, please correct me, um, um, Pascal. Um, um, there are often informations of the patient group. So I think that uh, it's often a good overview. And um, for me, you, you should not be as, uh, you, haven't, you haven't to treat yourself. So I think it's important to have information, um, especially the information who triggers you to be to be active. I think it's also as you're talking, Greta, um, it reminded me of a situation in that when you go to midwife's appointments, um, they are also taught to look out for uh, other things and other situations, sometimes in like the case of like domestic violence, and they might be looking out for things like large areas of bruising on your body, which mm -hmm. of course, if you are taking heparin or you are uh, have a low platelet mm -hmm. count, then of course you tend to bruise easily as well. So I mm -hmm. think that's a case where it's really important to be educated on your illness so that you can answer those questions and then mm -hmm. divert somebody to a specialist mm -hmm. if they had concerns. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and then also additionally, um, in my experience, I know that I was feeling a little nervous about um, uh, getting close to delivery. I was nervous about um, kind of like the what if situations and what if mm -hmm. I had to have a cesarean, what was the bleeding what was going to happen with bleeding what was going to happen with my um my treatments and uh i think it was my obstetrician but i'm not i can't quite remember suggested that i actually sit down and meet an anesthetist to talk to them about it and that was a really useful experience so mm -hmm. i think it's important that um uh during pregnancy patients are um forward in coming forward and forward in asking questions it doesn't yeah. there's no silly questions in this scenario really yeah, I think I think helpful would be if you have one person you talk talk with. It's a little bit difficult if you have uh, three different persons and you have always to explain um, the same. I, I think it's uh, uh, it's uh, um, different if you have three uh, uh, um, um, uh, specialists from. Um, if you have an, an hematologist and the gynecologist and the anesthetist, uh, but but if you have uh, three gynecologists uh, where you have to explain um, every time um, again the problems, um, it's uh, it's not so easy. So yeah, and and maybe it would make sense to say that the hematologist should maybe take the lead, and it's important yeah. to get all specialists like the gynecologist yeah. and the hematologist to speak to each other and uh, ask them to to uh, get educated or supported by the hematologist. Yeah. And also maybe uh, if, if you, I think with such a rare disease, you, you won't find adequate information anywhere uh, written out. You probably have to search for it. And I think the um, idea of talking to your national patient organization is not bad because even if they don't have information material on that, they can tell you who is the specialist in your country for that and who you could ask or who you could talk to and uh, such things. I think the hematologist should be in the, in the center of this network. 
and, and my experience is that the the colleagues you are in contact with the colleagues and um, you just give them the information regarding to the disorder and the point they have to, to look for very closely yeah so um, I think that that network is really um, important and so they happen to ask you again and again because they get they get the information uh, also from from the hematologist the one and only chance. <laughs> I, I have something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have something. Um, I would just like to mention that it's extremely important that all patients with rare, rare disorders uh, just join in registry. And so we have registry for PH uh, at the moment, and we start um, hopefully very soon. Um, 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 another uh, new registry and um, in a plastic in India we have in, uh, in Germany a registry and I think in, in other European countries uh, as well um, and I can just invite you please um, participate in registries because this is the only option to answer uh, such special questions in, in rare disorders. And can you maybe say why this also has an effect on future pregnancies and maybe just explain, uh, uh, you could explain what a registry really is. I think that's really important too. Should I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. You see, um, this data um, we collected in 2015, uh, regarding to Ecolizumab uh, in, uh, in pregnancies based on the registry dates. And um, without that registries, we, we have not no um, option to uh, collect the data and um, just analyze them uh, statistically so that we can say, okay, this is really, um, this is really an association. And uh, so, um, the registry, um, the PNH registry, was essential for uh, for the treatment uh, now because we we saw that the risk for thrombobolic events is higher if the LDH is high in clinical symptoms there. So, so these are now um, the indicators for starting treatment and so on and. Um, we have now um, more, more treatments and in the future we have to decide which treatment will be the best for which patient. And so uh, this uh, registry are um, enormous important and um, uh, they are, I think we have um, fast, um, fast results for patient care. In, in this context, and so I think it's really important um, just to uh, to be active in, in this way. Yeah. yeah, and it's probably the most important study for us patients because it just it's over a long, long period of time. Data will be collected of many, many patients globally, and uh, they are analyzed in different ways to answer questions so it's really important and so uh, it's not just i think important is to know these are not just uh, some scientific questions these are really questions for daily life uh, with with pnh or plastic anemia so um it's regarding to pregnancy it's regarding quality of life um uh, it's regarding risk for thrombobolic events. So that um, I think um, it's, it's really important. Thanks. Any questions on that maybe? Okay, so I think if there are no further comments, we can maybe close the session. And so I would like to thank all of you for having been here and also Dr. Hoffman and to Alex Snyder. Thank you very much.
Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.